Welcome to the Common Man Football Show. My name is James Coburn, and today's episode is the San Francisco 49ers draft class. Starting with the first pick of the draft, Solomon Thomas, uh, defensive end slash defensive tackle from Stanford. When it comes to his production at the defensive end position, he scored 91.33 in terms of solo tackle market share, 58.79 when it comes to sack market share, and 85.43 when it comes to tackle for loss market share. All those marks are good except for the sack market share. Uh, but this is Solomon Thomas's production compared to Khalil Mack's uh, production in college. Uh, there are similarities there where these are two guys who had very, very high solo tackle market share, very, very high tackle for loss market share, but didn't quite have adequate sack market share, but of course have turned themselves into perennial Pro Bowl slash All Pro players. And then when you come to athleticism, this is where the this is where all the stuff is when it comes to Solomon Thomas. He scored 95.68 in terms of explosiveness for his size, 94.5 down when it comes to speed for his size, and 98.94 when it comes to flexibility for his size. He is a elite athlete. If there ever was an elite athlete, and this is actually Khalil Mack compared to Solomon Thomas in terms of athleticism, uh, Thomas is a much more flexible player than, than, than Khalil Mack. And the bottom line is, when I look at Solomon Thomas from just a data perspective, everything is pointing towards Pro Bowl slash All Pro outcomes. Uh, for the most part. All pro outcomes are a little bit wishy-washy based on his sack market share, uh, but there is enough positive things from his athleticism to his other production and to how his production stacks up to Khalil Mack, for example, to where I, I feel pretty comfortable projecting him as one of, if not uh, the best prospect in the 2017 NFL draft class. He has that sort of potential to become that type of player, just like Khalil Mack had that potential uh, to be the best player in that class. Then we come to the next pick in terms of Reuben Foster, linebacker at Alabama. Unfortunately, he doesn't have any athleticism testing, but what we do know is in terms of his production, he scored 71.38 in terms of solo tackle market share production. And based on uh, all, every single linebacker since the 1996 NFL draft class that was drafted uh, and also players that were in the NFL, Based on that sample, 100% of Pro Bowl linebackers scored 77 or higher when it comes to solo tackle market share, and all pro linebackers scored 91 or higher when it comes to solo tackle market share production. And unfortunately, Ruben Foster doesn't hit the Pro Bowl level when it comes to solo tackle market share production, and he doesn't hit the all pro level when it comes to solo tackle market share production on top of his age score of 55.87, which also doesn't hit high quality outcomes. Bottom line, when it comes to Ruben Foster, despite the fact that I don't have any athleticism data to really determine that sort of spectrum for him. I think you're looking at a long-term starter, uh, someone like that's the best case scenario is a long-term starter and you just kind of work from there. But in terms of high quality outcomes, those are just off the table when it comes to Rune Foster based on his production and based on his age. I don't really care about the character stuff. All I care about is the stuff that's on paper and the stuff that's on paper doesn't say that he's going to become an elite player based on every single elite player since the 1996 NFL draft class. Then we come to uh, Kilo Witherspoon, cornerback out of Colorado. When it comes to his production, he scored 42.62 in terms of solo tackle market share, 91.44 when it comes to pass flexion market share. Uh, when it comes to solo tackle market share, he pretty much hits near the Pro Bowl level when it comes to that uh, measure. And then when it comes to pass flexion market share, he hits the Pro Bowl slash All Pro level when it comes to pass flexion market share production which also helps him based on his athleticism where he had 86.09 in terms of explosiveness for a size, 63.57 when it comes to speed for a size, and 66.94 when it comes to flexibility for a size. This kind of skill set fits best in a zone type of scheme. He's basically that classic lengthy corner uh, who is powerful, who can come downhill in one direction, but you don't necessarily want, uh, you know, you, you don't want him to be a guy where he doesn't have safety help. Uh, because he doesn't quite have the speed and flexibility to hang with every single wide receiver. But he does have enough positive traits that if you have the right type of defense that has a very good back end safety, uh, then you can do a lot of things with him and be creative and stuff like that. So I think this is going to be a good pick. He has the potential to be a Pro Bowl player. And nothing about his, uh, his profile says that that's not a possibility. So I think that that's a great pick for them in terms of the day two area. Then we come to the next pick of the draft in terms of C.J. Beathard, quarterback out of Iowa when it comes to his uh, college production he scored 71.28 out of 100 which is only starter level when it comes to his college production again when to hit all pro level or pro bowl level you have to score 80 to 90 or higher when it comes to this particular metric and 
the only players who did not have as high of 80 or 90 who ended up becoming Pro Bowl slash All-Pro players are uh, Matt Hasselbeck, uh, who was not drafted this early, uh, Brett Favre, and I'm, I'll, w I'll wait for people to compare C.J. Pether to Brett Favre, and of course Drew Bledsoe uh, as well, which I, I don't think that C.J. Beathard is Drew Bledsoe either. If you just watch, if you watch Drew Bledsoe back then, to Drew Bledsoe, like there's no comparison. So basically, C.J. Beathard has the potential to be a starter. Maybe he becomes Kirk Cousins-ish, like that. That is a possibility, uh, potentially, very unlikely. Uh, but that's at least sort of what you should expect in terms of his college production, in terms of projection. And we come to the next pick of the draft in terms of Joe Williams, running back out of Utah. When it comes to his production, he scored 71.82. When it comes to his total offensive market share production, which is very good, uh, and athleticism-wise, he scored 64.25 in terms of explosiveness for his size, 85.88 when it comes to speed for his size, and 61.91 when it comes to flexibility for his size. With the only issue in his profile, realistically, is his age. He scored a 14.08 age score, which based on every single multiple Pro Bowl slash All-Pro running back since the 1999 NFL draft class, they had significantly better age scores than that. Uh, so high quality outcomes are kind of off the table. But the one thing I can say about this pick is it does make sense that Kyle Shannon would take a back that's kind of like this. Uh, he, he has good production. He has good athleticism. Uh, Thomas Jones is another guy who is a little bit older too, who kind of fits this kind of profile as a back. So I think Joe Williams is going to be a successful player based on his production, based on his athleticism. Uh, it's just that things like consistent Pro Bowls or consistent All Pro stuff, I think most of that stuff will only be achieved uh, if if he gets into the right system, which I think he is in a very good system. So, uh, but yeah, I think Joe Williams. That's just kind of what you should expect when it comes to him. Um, is someone who based on the system, could become a very special player because Kyle Shanahan's system can do that with players. But at the same time, high-quality outcomes are also just less likely uh, despite systems uh, at times. So I would just worry about that from that kind of aspect. But if you want to just roll the dice with athleticism and production, he has that kind of stuff. Uh, then we come to the next pick of the draft in terms of George Kittle, tight end out of Iowa. When it comes to his production, he scored 58.36, uh, which basically his Pro Bowl level in terms of tight end production and in terms of athleticism, he scored 88.95 in terms of explosiveness for a size, 93.96 in terms of speed for a size, and unfortunately he didn't do any flexibility testing in terms of his profile. He's another guy who the major issues realistically is just age. His age score is 19.84, uh, which doesn't hit high quality outcomes when it comes to the tight end position. But he's a good athlete. He has, uh, again, decent production. Not great production, but decent production. I think you have a long-term starter here. And I think he's a guy who definitely, as a blocker at least, which I don't know if they put tight ends in the in the Pro Bowl for blocking, but at least as a blocker, he has some positive things that you can look at to where I could say that, yeah, long-term starter is, is definitely a possibility with George Kittle. Uh, then we come to the next pick of the draft in terms of Trent Taylor, wide receiver out of Louisiana Tech. When it comes to his production, he scored 74.21 in terms of his passing yardage market share production. Uh, and when it comes to athleticism, he scored 22.48 in terms of explosiveness for a size, 15.95 when it comes to speed for a size, and 77.3 now when it comes to flexibility for a size. His big issues, realistically, is really what Wes Walker's issues were. Uh, he's essentially a shorter Wes Walker, and this is actually Wes Walker's athleticism compared to Trent Taylor's athleticism. They're basically almost identical when it comes to their athletic skill sets, uh, but... Uh, my only issue again with him is just that uh, in terms of, it's really this, it's the schedule adjusted production. Uh, when you look at schedule adjusted production for Trent Taylor, he did not play a very tough schedule, which is the opposite of what Wes Welker faced at Texas Tech. And this is actually Wes Welker's schedule adjusted production compared to Trent Taylor's schedule adjusted production. Um, so uh, there's some things that worry me about Trent Taylor, just based on the, the basic things in terms of size and stuff like that. Uh, because Wes Walker is a guy who is a bit of an outlier uh, because of just how funky his sort of profile is. But at the very least, Trent Taylor can become a slot receiver, and I think you have some positives there uh, because he can become that. It's just high, high, high quality outcomes like Wes Walker's status is something that's a little bit less likely despite some of the similarities between them. 
Uh, and then we come to the next pick of the draft in terms of DJ Jones, defensive tackle out of Ole Miss. When it comes to his production, he scored 50.98 in terms of solo tackle market share, 68.38 when it comes to sack market share, and 25.4 now when it comes to tackle for loss market share, which are not great. He didn't really hit high quality outcomes overall when you just look at his production, uh, just you know, just glancing at it, he didn't really hit that. But what he does have that's really positive is athleticism. When it comes to athleticism, he scored 87.78 in terms of explosives for his size, 93.44 when it comes to speed for his size, and 87 in terms of flexibility for his size. He's a tremendous athlete. This type of player comes around a lot. It's it's a it's a player, a defensive tackle that comes from a big time program and isn't incredibly productive, but but isn't like terrible, terrible productive like DJ Jones does have. A decent sack market share. He does have at least average solo tackle market share, so he's not completely out of the realm of becoming a starter. And he has great athleticism. Uh, so usually this type of guy works out. Now they don't usually hit a high high quality outcomes though, you know, but they do end up at least becoming starters. So like Paul Soliali and um, you know certain certain players like that kind of fit what DJ Jones uh, is in terms of athleticism and production. So. I would say that that's kind of what you should expect from DJ Jones, a guy that can become a potential starter, but he may not really hit high quality outcomes because of just his production was so poor, uh, especially when it comes to tackle for loss uh, production. Uh, then we come to the next pick in terms of uh, uh, PETA, a defensive end out of Utah. When it comes to his production, he scored 45.23 in terms of solo tackle market share, 42.34 in terms of sack market share, and 36.56 when it comes to tackle for loss market share. Which is not getting it done when it comes to high quality outcomes. All of those marks are below average. And when it comes to athleticism, he scored 6.6 .6 in terms of explosiveness for his size, 73.48 when it comes to speed for his size, and 87.50 when it comes to flexibility for his size. The only real issue here is that explosiveness. Uh, there's never been a high quality uh, player, you know, Pro Bowl slash All Pro player with explosiveness that low. Uh, but he does have speed, he does, and he does have nearly flexibility. I think there is a skill set here that he could become a starter, like he has a starter skill set based on his athleticism. Uh, but I do worry about the production, and I do do worry about that explosiveness. Uh, like, why is that so low? Why is his explosive numbers so low? So there are some red flags here, but at least you have a guy that could become a potential starter, and he does have some things intriguing in terms of his skill set. And then come to the last pick of the draft in terms of Adrian Colbert, uh, cornerback out of Miami. When it comes to his production, he scored 12.26 in terms of solo tackle market share, 27.42 when it comes to pass selection market share. Uh, unfortunately, his age score isn't really that great. He scored a 37.42 age score, which doesn't hit any of the high quality outcomes when it comes to that position, and neither does his production. The only reason why I can honestly believe that the 49ers drafted Adrian Colbert was because of athleticism. Because uh, he scored 60.68 in terms of explosiveness for his size, 95.68 when it comes to speed for his size, and 50.36 when it comes to flexibility for his size. But if you've been following my work long enough and just in general understand just basic facts, uh, just because a cornerback is athletic doesn't mean that they're going to be great. And every single great cornerback had great athleticism, but they also had great production to match. Cornerback production matters. So... Despite the fact that Adrian Colbert has some very intriguing athleticism traits, which he does, and, you know, more better to him. But when you have production that's this low, 12.26 in terms of solo tackle market share, 27.42 when it comes to pass deflection market share. Based on all the data that I do, that is risk of bust, you know, not really making it at all status. So as much as he does have athleticism that could be indicative of a potential starter, I would near on the side that he may not become a starter just based on his production uh he could, again he could be a starter but it would be extremely unlikely that he would become a starter just solely on athleticism when there have been tons of cornerbacks who had great athleticism but didn't have great production didn't have production that like had production this low who didn't really become anything at all so that's the only thing that kind of worries me about adrian colbert and i know he's a late pick and i understand all that stuff but you could have done better taking a player who at least had a fighting chance to become a long-term starter instead of a guy who most likely will not become a long-term starter because that production is as low as it is on top of his age. So how do I feel about the San Francisco 49ers draft class? Well, I think it's one of the better draft classes in the cl in the uh, in the class. I think you, know, you got Solomon Thomas, who's one of the best uh, defensive players and overall player in the entire draft class from an athleticism standpoint and somewhat 
uh, from you know a production standpoint if you just discount the sack market share. Uh, you get Ruben Foster. I'm not the biggest fan of, but he is a guy who can become a long-term starter. You get a killer with a spoon who has Pro Bowl potential based on his production, based on his athleticism. You get C.J. Beathard, who is most likely a backup, but could become a Kirk Cousins-like player. That, that That's possible. Uh, you get Joe Williams, who has you know decent uh, sort of uh, production. Uh, and athleticism, but just age kind of discounts him a bit. But in Kyle Shanahan's system, he makes lemons out of lemonade. He, he makes lemonade out of lemons, guys. So as much as Joe Williams may look like a lemon on the surface based on his age, I would not be surprised if, if Kyle Shanahan's system makes Joe Williams into a very highly productive player. Uh, George Kittle also is a guy that could end up being a long-term starter, uh, most likely based on, his, uh, based on his athleticism, based on some of his production traits. Trent Taylor has the potential to be a starting slot receiver. With athleticism to match that sort of thing. DJ Jones also has the potential to be a long term starter. PETA has some intriguing starter stuff. And Adrian Colbert is really the only player who's like a big dud or a thud type of guy who just doesn't really have that m enough positives for me to really say that he's gonna, he's going to become a long term starter. So overall, I mean, it's a great, it's a very good class. So I, I like all the picks. I don't, again, I don't like all the picks, but I do like the fact that they did get a lot of players of high quality potential. And they also got lots of players that can become long-term stars. And they also got guys that in their system could be very interesting. So again, my name is James Coburn. And you can follow my work at draftcoburn.wordpress.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at Geometrics. Again, if you like this content, if you want more content like this, feel free to like and subscribe. That really helps me out a lot. Uh, share this video with friends and whoever you know that you want to share this video with uh, to, to kind of get them to kind of raise awareness about what I do and stuff like that. And I will talk to you guys in the next video. Peace.